Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, when Kyle told me that we were going to be walking through the book of Romans this year, I was so excited. I, I, I love the book of Romans. There's so much we can learn from it, just going through it verse by verse. And I hope you paid attention to what he said about Easter. Easter is a time when, when people are open to spiritual invitations. And so take advantage of that opportunity. They, they say that somewhere between 40% and 50% of the time, a person will say yes if you invite them to come to an Easter service, if you have that friendship and relationship with them. So scatter those seeds, and, and we look forward to what God does here next weekend. I love this section of Romans that we're in right now, Romans chapter 4. We're calling this, this part of the series Essential Questions. And we all have them about God. The, the journey to uncover these answers builds a foundation for what we believe and how it is that we live. And these essential questions are key truths that the book of Romans addresses in order to anchor our faith no matter what we may face. I performed a, a wedding for some good friends back at the end of last summer. And a few months before, I was meeting with them. I was asking them about how they met, when they started dating. I always like to find those personal details out and then share them in the, in the wedding. And they shared with me that after three or four dates, they were standing in a restaurant parking lot and uh, they had their first kiss. And when Cody kissed Leanna, immediately she said, hey, you, you, need, to, you need to call my dad. And that was her, her first response. You need to call my dad. And he's like, okay, okay. It, it didn't matter that Cody was 28 years old and they was seven foot tall and plays in the NBA. She said, you need to call my dad and get his permission if things are gonna move more serious. So she, she gave her dad's number to Cody and the next day, Cody thought, well, I'll, I'll give him a call and have a little perfunctory five minute conversation. But it lasted 45 minutes. And like any good father, Mark was looking out for his little girl and he began firing essential questions. And he said, Cody, what are your intentions with my daughter? Do you know what a healthy marriage looks like? What type of physical boundaries have you set? And then he said, Cody, when I held my daughter in my arms for the very first time, I knew that I would die for her. Do you have that same level of commitment? And Cody's thinking, I just want to kiss her in the Applebee's parking lot. <laughs> but all joking aside, you know, uh, when I asked permission to share this story, Cody, Cody sent me this, this picture. He took this selfie after the phone call. <laughs> now, this guy guards the toughest men in the NBA, but he is sweating profusely after this call. If that's your daughter, you're going to ask some essential questions. What's going through the mind of the daughter's father? Can, can I trust you? Are you the type of man that I'm willing to risk it all with to be in a relationship with my precious daughter? And today we come to this section in Romans chapter four where we will be faced with a similar question. What does God expect of me? What does he want from me? And the simple short answer is your faith, your trust. But is God deserving of your trust? And that's what we wanna to unpack today. The father was calling Cody to a higher level of faithfulness, and that's what I wanna to try to do with you today. The same thing. You can have faith in the one who is faithful. And like a father vetting the character of his daughter's boyfriend, some of you might be investigating Christianity right now and wondering what God is like and what would he want from, from your life? Others of you might be a, a seasoned believer and you need to be reminded of why you believe what you believe. You know, the word faith and the concept of, of faith is talked about a lot in the, in the middle of Romans chapter four, where Paul continues to talk about Abraham in this passage. Kyle talked about it last week in the first part of Romans four. He continues to talk about him, Paul does in Romans chapter four, this Jewish patriarch named Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. And when it comes to faith, Abraham is a really good example for us. Now he's not a perfect one, but he's a really good one. And let's begin by defining the word faith. Fortunately for us, the Bible specifically defines it. 
because I think it's so important that God wanted to make doubly sure that the meaning was clear and so we would understand his expectation. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. There are two components of of faith. Sometimes we use a chair to illustrate really what's going on with faith. When I see this at a glance, I immediately know that this is a chair, right? I mean, just at a glance, you see four, four legs, you see something to sit on, you see a back there. And in your mind, intellectually, you know that that is a chair. But there's a second component to faith. And that's what you can't see and what you might be a little unsure of. I know that it's a chair, but I can't see whether it's sturdy enough to hold me. I don't really put my faith in that until I sit down and I put my weight on it. And when I put my weight on it, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I trust you. I I know that it can hold me. You see, it's one thing to look at the chair. It's another thing to sit in the chair. And Abraham didn't just look at the chair. He sat down in it. And we will see that time and time again throughout all of Romans chapter four, as we see his faith expressed. You know, there's one verse in in Romans chapter four. It's actually the 18th verse. And it's basically a summary of what we're going to look at today. Here's what Paul says. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. God in his inspired word has that description of Abraham. It sounds almost like an epitaph. So let me just walk through these verses and make some observations as we see Abraham's inspiring faith. We begin with verse 16 of Romans chapter four. It says, so the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. Well, what's, what's the promise? Well, God had promised Abraham to be the father of a nation and his offspring, he promised him incredible blessings for believing in the one true God. But Abraham couldn't couldn't see that. He had to accept it by faith. It was a gift from God. It's much like salvation. Kyle talked about this last week in the early part of Romans 4, how we can't earn our way to heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't plead your way into heaven. It's a gift. But for a gift to be a gift, we must receive that gift. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's it's only by the grace of God through your faith. Look at Romans chapter four, verse 16, the second part of it. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's says, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. In other words, you don't have to have a perfect 100% record of never breaking the law. That would be impossible. Jesus wouldn't have needed to come to the earth if you could live a perfect life. But the gift of salvation isn't based on your perfection. It's through your faith in the only one who was perfect. Romans chapter four, verse 16 and 17. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. So let me just take you all the way back to Genesis. And I'm gonna show you in Genesis and in Romans, the faith that Abraham exemplified through three different snapshots in his life. Here's the first one. Abraham had faith that God wanted to use him. God hand selects Abraham and lays out a plan that will involve him leaving where he is comfortable and established. But I want you to to look at what he promises. Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now it's 
it's never easy to leave home, to walk away from a place of comfort where you have settled in and you know the routine. But the Bible tells us that Abraham took his wife not knowing where they were going. Now that's faith. God saw in Abraham a heart of faith. His trust in God was distinctive. That's why God chose to make him the the father of this nation. God has plans for Abraham and he has plans for you as well. It might be for you to make your faith evident in a college classroom when your professor is mocking the fact that, that God created this universe. It might be for you to be that lone voice for biblical values in your cul-de-sac. It's probably not to be the father of a nation, but his plan for you is to be a father to the children that he's entrusted to you. God wants to use your life. And sometimes Satan clouds our mind with the sins of our past or in our decisions in the present. And we wonder if God still would want to use us. Why would God want to use me? And yet the Bible is filled time and time again with people who had a faith in God and God wanted to use their imperfect lives to his glory. So we're all prime candidates for God to use. Now, Paul continues to hold up Abraham as an example. Here in this second snapshot, Abraham believed God keeps his promises. Look at Romans chapter four, verse 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Back in Genesis chapter 18, God communicates to Abraham that within a year, he says, your wife will have a son. And and Sarah overhears God communicating this to Abraham and Sarah laughs. That's understandable. She was 89 years old when she heard this. And the New Life version of the Bible explains it quite delicately. It says the the way of women had stopped for Sarah. And we later learn that uh, this conversation, this promise when it's given and when she laughs, that becomes the name of Isaac. Isaac means she laughs. So if you, if you think about it, God made them wait and wait and wait for that miracle. And the waiting only made the miracle more impressive. Let me let this next verse sink in with you. Romans chapter four, verse 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. I think that's a funny verse. <laughs> If you stop and and think about it, Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. I'm just trying to picture them sending out invitations for the gender reveal party. (laughs) Come Sunday at 3 p.m., plenty of parking here at the nursing home. (laughs) Hors d'oeuvres and cream corn will be served. You know, I, I don't know. Romans chapter four, verse 20. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. It never wavered. Now, I don't think that means that he didn't have some days of doubt or some moments of uncertainty. And I can say that because of what happened with he and Hagar. Do you remember that? Do you remember who Hagar was? Evidently, Sarah's faith wasn't as strong as Abraham's because when she didn't come preg- become pregnant for a number of years after God had said he will be the father uh, of a nation, she began to take matters into her own hands. At this time, she's in her mid-70s, decades past the childbearing years. And she went to her husband, Abraham, and she said, God says you're gonna be the father of a nation, but it sure doesn't look like it's going to happen through me. So why don't you take my maidservant, Hagar, as your wife also, and sleep with her so that the family tree can go on? And Abraham says, okay. (laughs) And he takes her to be his wife, and he sleeps with Hagar, and she becomes pregnant 
and gives him a son named Ishmael. Now, Abraham didn't have to do that. Abraham could have said, you know what? I don't think this is God's plan for me to have more than one wife. And you know what? Just be patient, Sarah. Your plan doesn't seem like it would be God's plan. I have faith in what God's promised. But that's not what he says. Instead, he takes the hall pass. And Sarah gets mad at Hagar. And that was 4,000 years ago. And yet the conflict that arose out of that poor decision has mushroomed into the unrest between two groups, the Arabs and the Jews, fulfilling scripture that there would always be hostility. I think that Abraham learned from jumping the gun and having a child with Hagar. That was a mistake. But for the scripture to say that he never wavered in his faith clearly indicates to me that he learned his lesson. Because please don't miss this. The Bible says that throughout his life, his faith grew stronger and stronger and that that brings glory to God. So what does God want from you? What does he want from you? He wants your faith in him. So yes, sing your praises to the Lord at the top of your lungs. Lift your hands to the sky in honor of him. But if you really wanna bring him glory, go a step further and give him your faith. Give him your trust. Trust that his will is better than your agenda. Even when things don't go the way that you want, when things don't go the way that you hope. Last March, after a long day of travel, I had a late night mental lapse and I left my laptop on a flight from Louisville to Baltimore. But before I even got my rental car in Baltimore, I'd already called the airlines. I turned in a lost and found request. I did everything I could to get it back before anyone learned of my forgetfulness. But after a couple of days, I had to explain to family and friends why I was without that slender silver machine that is my constant companion. Now, I thought my family members and close friends would be sympathetic to my honest mistake but they were downright brutal to me. How in the world could you leave a laptop on a flight? I thought I gave them some convincing reasons, but they openly mocked me with their insensitive comments, (laughs) calling me Mr. Magoo, the absent-minded preacher. They even stooped so low as to start calling me Dementia Dave. I know. Didn't matter that that my grandmother had dementia. Didn't matter that my dad who died recently had dementia. Now they were claiming that I had it. While God is gracious and merciful and abounding in love, my family and friends are not. (laughs) And the only encouragement that I received was that they were all quite certain that the airlines would find my laptop and they would return it to me. Don't give up hope, Dave. Well, after about 14 days, I had to break down and get a new laptop, and I had to have someone reload over 4,000 Word documents onto a new laptop. You talk about embarrassing and a hassle. And yet, even when there was no reason for hope, I kept hoping. But fast forward 10 months later. It's January the 1st. I had flown into Phoenix late the night before to attend the Fiesta Bowl with my son, Sam, And halfway through the game, I got a text message from the nice young lady who works in the IT department and helps me with my computer issues. She wrote, I just got a very weird voicemail here in the IT office saying that they have found your laptop, but I wanted to see if it was a scam because it sounded so sketchy. I replied back, oh, that's the one, that's the one. I lost it 10 months ago, I can't believe they found it. Yes, yes, please call them. And I was elated, but it was the next message that was rather troubling because she texted me and said, yes, it was an airline calling saying they found it on a plane in Phoenix. And I thought, that's strange. (laughs) That's 2,000 miles from Baltimore. I flew into Phoenix last night. (laughs) 
Oops, I did it again. <laughs> I, I felt so sick to my stomach. There I sat, surrounded by tens of thousands of sports fans, and yet I felt like I was in my own private Alzheimer's unit. <laughs> I was embarrassed yet grateful. I couldn't wait for the game to end because until I had that laptop in my grasp, I, I wouldn't rest. And when I got to the airport, I, I went up to the lady. I was just so happy. I, I gave her $20. I tried to give her a hug. She took the money, not the hug. <laughs> I want you to try to put yourself in my shoes when I started getting those text messages and when reality sunk in of my repeat performance. One minute before, I had been having the time of my life, enjoying the game without a care in the world. Why? Because I was oblivious to my own dilemma. You see, when it came to my laptop, I didn't know it was lost until it was found. And if you think about it, that may be a perfect description of the person who you invite to an Easter service this week. They just may be oblivious to what's at stake and the eternal consequences of putting their faith in Christ or of rejecting Christ. And so scatter those seeds. Let the world know he is risen. The moral of my story, always put your laptop back in your computer bag when you're landing. And don't put your faith in your memory the airlines, a company that you work for, or your 401k. Don't put your faith in yourself. Don't put your faith on the shelf because there are people that need the hope of Jesus this Easter. And he's the only one worthy of our complete faith and trust. And we need to have an urgency when it comes to sharing that with others. As a Christian, you're not better than anyone else, but you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to guide you and to deepen you in your faith. Believers do not live as those who have no purpose. We do not struggle as those who have no strength. We do not endure as those who have no peace. We do not suffer as those who have no joy. We do not fear as those who have no faith. Why? Because he is faithful. He is true. You can trust him. You are not alone. And Christians don't die without hope. Because as you'll be reminded next week, since Jesus conquered the grave, you can too. Romans chapter four, verse 21, Paul says he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Fully convinced. The Christian life is not for the half-hearted. We can't be part-time Christians. You don't act one way when you're with your church friends and another way when you're with your work friends. It's not, I'll trust him when his will lines up with my desires. It's fully believing that God will be true and faithful. And with God, it's promises made and promises kept. And that leads us to our final snapshot. Abraham believed that God was more powerful than death. Death is perhaps Satan's strongest weapon in his arsenal of evil, but God is more powerful. Back in Genesis chapter 22, God's gonna put Abraham to the test. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called, yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah and go sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Hey, Abraham had waited his entire life for Isaac to be born. And to say that they had a close relationship would be an understatement. And scripture tell us, tells us that if he and his son left early the next morning, I promise you they didn't tell mom where they were going. And they began a 50 mile walk. And when they came to the foothills of, of that mountain, he told all the servants, he said, you, you guys stay here. We're going to go worship. And he took his son up to the top of that mountain. And his son said, where's the sacrifice? He says, God will provide. And then the Bible says, 
that he bound his son. I don't know how a 110, 112 year old man can bind an energetic young man. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if God caused Isaac to go into a deep sleep. I don't know. We'll find out someday in heaven. It says he bound him there. And the reason he bound him there and took out a knife is because the New Testament tells us that Abraham reasoned in his heart that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. I mean, you talk about a faith. This is thousands of years before Lazarus. This is thousands of years before Jairus' daughter. This is thousands of years before Jesus walked out of his own tomb. But Abraham, that early on, believed God can bring back the dead. He picks up a knife. He starts to sacrifice his son. And he hears from heaven his name being called, Abraham, Abraham, verse 12 Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Interesting wording. Your son, your only son. God the Father intervened and stopped the sacrifice from happening. Now we go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 22. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. It all comes back to believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul points out that Abraham was righteous, but he wasn't perfect. And that should make each and every one of us at every campus feel so much better because if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and live for him, then someday when you stand before God and he looks at you, he's not gonna see your sins. He's gonna see the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean that you're not gonna have some times of doubt on some difficult days, some nights when your head hits the pillow and you say, why God? Or where are you, God? The psalmist says 20 times, King David says 20 times in the book of Psalms, he says, how long, oh God? How long? So you're not alone. And if you've never had any doubts in your faith, then you may not have much of a faith. Let me tell you Nikki's story. Nikki lives in Arizona. She'd grown up, grown up going to church more out of duty than devotion. She totally got away, it, away from it when she was on her own. She'd never really had a personal relationship with Christ in her life until a couple of years after marriage, she started going to a, a great church there. And she and her husband started growing spiritually. And within the year, they were excited to learn that they were pregnant. Six months along in her pregnancy, it was during covid She felt like she was going into labor one day and she called her doctor up and the doctor said, you know, I mean, it's your first child. You probably don't really know exactly what labor feels like. Uh, You're probably just having some some pains. Uh, Just just, uh, everything's cool. But she didn't feel comfortable and she went to the hospital and she was in labor and she gave birth. Nikki had felt like God had intervened and safely brought this little guy into the world. He was in the NICU unit, gaining weight, improving each and every day, until one day about a month later, the the nurse called her in a panic and said, Nikki, you and Hector need to get back up here. That day her baby passed away. They say it was a rare infection. They still aren't exactly certain. And what had been such an encouraging, upbeat, optimistic season of gratitude to God, as you can imagine, became a very dark season for Nikki. And when her baby boy passed away, so did her faith. And she became angry with God. She began to doubt his existence. If there was a God, there's there's no way that a loving God would allow any mother to go through what I went through. And she distanced herself from God and from church. But about a year later, 
With her faith just barely hanging by a thread, she ventured her way back to church. And it was Mother's Day of all days. And that particular day, a woman shared her testimony of her teenage son dying. And the woman talked through all of the feelings that she had. She talked about how her faith was shaken. And many of the thoughts that she experienced and spoke of were the very ones that that Nikki had been feeling. And then this speaker said, but I came to realize that my, my son never was mine. He had always belonged to God. He wasn't mine. And as she spoke, Nikki in her grief and pain began to feel that seed of faith that had dissipated. And she felt that seed beginning to grow. And even where there was no hope or reason for hope, she chose to hope. And she began leaning into her faith and returning to it. And she chose to take a step of faith and sit in that chair to believe and trust in a God who allows things to happen that we don't want or that we don't understand. She chose faith in the one who knows what it's like to lose a son. And she began digging into God's word And she felt that since she had walked away from her faith, she wanted the Lord to to know that she placed her full faith, her unwavering faith in God. And last weekend I had the privilege to baptize her when I was preaching in Phoenix. And to see her joy, to see her joy, it was a bold declaration of her faith. She has a faith that God is sturdy, that God is trustworthy. Have you ever experienced something like that? Were you devastated by an unexpected loss or the engagement got broken off or your job evaluated or your health deteriorated and so did your faith? God's not going to test your faith by asking you to sacrifice a loved one like he he did Abraham. But throughout your life, You will have some even when there is no hope moments. And I pray that you'll keep hoping and trusting in God. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. And maybe for some of you, it feels like you've been waiting and waiting and waiting on God's promises. Like Abraham and Sarah, maybe you're waiting to be able to have a baby. Or or maybe you're waiting for that, that job offer to come or that special guy to call, or the chemo to work, or the family conflict to heal. But let me remind you that the waiting, the waiting only makes the miracle more powerful when it comes. And you can trust him, whether that miracle comes on this side of heaven or there. Have faith that someday God will make all things right. Trust in the God who loved you so much that when his one and only son was placed on the altar of sacrifice, this time he didn't intervene and stop it because he knew that he could save his son or he could save us. And he chose us. Let me say it another way. He could have saved his son or he could have saved you. And he chose you. Sometimes, sometimes we ask you to take a stand for Jesus. But today I'm gonna ask you to take a seat. Take a seat for Jesus. You know about God. You know intellectually there's no way that this world could have just been spoken into existence or could have come about by a cosmic explosion or an accident. All you have to do is study the human eye and watch the birth of a baby. It changes everything. So we know what a God would be like. A God would be all powerful. A God would be all knowing. We we know intellectually what a God would be. So with what you know, are you willing to place your trust in him? Are you willing to do what Abraham did and not just look at the chair, but sit in the chair? Are you willing to say he is sturdy and he is strong and I can trust him with my future even when I don't understand it? When we are faithless, he is faithful. Nicknames are something that come about because of 
a person's physical attributes or maybe because of something a person does or it kind of embodies who they are. Did you know Jesus has a nickname? It's talked about in Revelation chapter three. It's also talked about in Revelation chapter 19. It's a name that he's called and he goes by. In fact, in Revelation chapter 19, when it describes him, it's at that moment when someday the trumpet will sound and the sky will split. It says that Jesus will come riding on a horse. And it tells us in Revelation 19 that the writer's name is faithful and true. That's Jesus' name. And so today I am asking you to put your faith, your complete faith in one who is faithful when we're faithless and say, Lord, I give up. Faith involves humility and it means swallowing your pride and saying, I might not understand everything about God, but that's what makes him God and it's what makes me the creation and not the creator and accept the fact that Jesus died for you, lived a perfect life, died that atoning death, conquered the grave so that you can conquer the grave and say, Lord, I put my faith in you. 